Would you please join me in standing for our gospel lesson? Our gospel lesson is taken from uh, the book of the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31 through 36, uh, reading in Christ's name. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. A slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Here ends our gospel lesson. You may be seated. I've always found chapter 8 to be one of the most fascinating chapters uh, in the Gospel of John. Both chapter 6 and chapter 8 are very telling because Jesus has uh, some very intense conversations with not only the religious leaders of Israel, but those who said they believed in word, but not in their heart. There's a substantial difference between believing in word and then believing in the heart. It begins as Jesus proclaims that I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. On the particular day he stood up and said this, they were actually celebrating the, their deliverance out of the land of Egypt. Now, if you go back and you read through Exodus and you read through how they were led out of the land of Egypt, as God you know, committed those 10 plagues to Egypt and Pharaoh finally released them, they crossed the Red Sea. There was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They were celebrating that pillar of fire by night. And as Jesus says, I am, he is literally calling himself the God who met Moses face to face in the burning bush, the God who delivered Israel out of the land of Egypt. From their conversation, it kind of becomes more and more tense with each passing exchange. Jesus actually calls them a liar, and he even says that they belong to the devil, that they are children of the devil. Now, Jesus doesn't do this in a malicious way. He's not trying to be derogatory or sarcastic. He's literally pleading for their souls. He cares so much about these people who are rejecting him that he is pleading for their soul. Now, I want to be fair, and so as Jesus stood up and said, I am the same God, the Yahweh God that led the children of Israel out of Egypt, Jesus is claiming to lead now a second exodus out of the consequences of sin, death, and the power of the devil. But to be fair, what Jesus was claiming was punishable by death according to Israeli law, according to Jewish law. So I kind of understand but if you start to see all of these different miracles, the feeding of the 5,000, which, you know, in this case was probably more like 15,000 because they just counted the men and they had the women and the children. Raising someone from the dead, I think that would get my attention. Uh, healing the sick, continuing to show miracle after miracle. And you cannot perform those types of miracles if God is not with you. And so there was kind of like this willful prideful rejection of Christ, this hardness of heart that existed because of pride, because of arrogance, and in some cases because of greed. But the thing that Jesus really wants us to hear this Reformation Sunday as we celebrate the Reformation of the church and the call to faith in Christ Jesus, reminding us that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. But what Jesus wants to make extremely clear is that he is the one who sets us free from the consequences of sin, death, and the power of the devil. He is the one that brings us into new life. And I think it's so appropriate that we celebrated a baptism this morning. He brings us into new life and gives us that promise that this world is not our home, the promise of eternal life. Let's pray with me, please. Lord, I thank you for this text and this reminder that you, Jesus, are the one that sets us free. Lord, I pray that every single word that proceeds from my mouth would be from you and not from me. I pray that it's in the power of your Holy Spirit, according to your holy word and not from myself. Jesus, I pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. I pray all of these things in Christ's precious name and all of God's people said. And so the very first thing that we see in our text is this. Jesus calls those who believe in him to abide in him. Jesus calls those who believe in him to abide in him. Now let's look at verses 31 and 32. Jesus said to the Jews, 
who had believed in him. But I want to stress that if you look through the whole chapter, those who believed in him in this text, it was kind of a superficial faith. It was kind of like in word alone, because when he began to test them and to to push what it was that they actually believed, it was in fact not Jesus. They did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So he says to them, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now you couple this statement with the I am statement, Jesus is literally claiming to be equal with the Father. Now the Jews knew knew this early on. Early on in the Gospel of John, it says that. It says that the Jews sought even more to kill him because he was calling himself the Son of God, making himself equal with God. So they knew what he was claiming. And so it's kind of interesting about Jesus. There's a C.S. Lewis book that talks about Jesus, and you can kind of only see Jesus in one of three lights. He's either totally crazy, right? <laughs> you know, he's not just a nice guy. He's either totally crazy, or he's, he's a misguided prophet, he's lying, or he's actually who he claims to be. There's kind of no middle ground, and the Jewish religious leaders understood this. You can't really just look at Jesus as, oh, he's just a nice guy and he's just a good teacher. No, he's claiming to be God. He's either lying, he's crazy, or he's right. Which one of the three is it? The word abide is a beautiful word and it's a continual process. It's not kind of a one and done. So abiding in Christ is something that happens continually. Jesus paints an incredibly beautiful picture of what this looks like in John chapter 15. He says this, Here's another I am statement. Again, making himself equal with God, the same God that delivered Israel out of the land of Egypt. He says, I am the vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Here we go. Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, Christ is the vine, we are the branches. Whoever abides in Christ, he is in us. They that abide in Christ will bear much fruit, for apart from Christ we can do nothing. And so there's this beautiful dependency upon Christ, and that's what Jesus is trying to not only tell us, but also those who were present in our text. As we grow in our dependency on God, and I will tell you that I I find it easier the older I get. I really wish it wasn't that way. Honestly, I look back as a young man, and I'm actually a little ashamed of how self-reliant I was. I really kind of thought I had it all together sometimes. And I was a fool. Jesus wants us to grow in our dependency upon him. Think about it. Well, if you take a branch out of the vine, how can it bear fruit? It can't. The branch receives all of its sustenance from the vine, and that's us. All of our spiritual sustenance, our salvation in the waters of baptism, continuing in faith, all comes from Christ because of what he has done. He is our source. That's what the writer of Hebrews was saying in Hebrews chapter 12, that we are to look to Jesus, the author, the initiator, and the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. He's the one who brings us to salvation in Christ, and as we continually trust in him, allowing the Father to prune us, which isn't always fun, because God disciplines those whom he loves. As we grow in Christ Jesus, trust in Christ all the days of our life, he will bring us to our true home, God's eternal kingdom. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through him. The final thing that we see in our text is this. Jesus speaks to those who need to be set free. Jesus, his word, speaks to those who need to be set free. Let's look at verses 33 through 36. And they answered him. This is an extremely interesting answer. And this is like probably one of the most graphic displays of denial I have ever seen. This is what they said. We are offsprings of Abraham, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. Little gaslighting going on there. Never been enslaved to anyone. Well, what about Egypt? What about the Babylonian captivity that happened in the 5th century BC? 
The fact that they were currently under Roman rule, they were a vassal country to the Roman Empire, they were just literally and totally lying. But for some weird reason, they believed the lie. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever known anyone to tell a lie so many times they actually started to believe it themselves? Yeah, it's kind of scary, isn't it? Never happens in politics, right? Just kidding. Probably shouldn't say that. Well, we'll just erase that one, right? <laughs> but in a religious or, or faith-based state of their heart, they were absolutely in denial. They thought that they were the way. They were trusting on their heritage. They literally were trusting in a man-made thing. Now, yes, God guided Abraham to be the father of Israel, but it was always the children of the promise, not the children of the flesh or the children of the nation. Remember, in a sense, Israel is a big funnel. God promised the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to and through the nation of Israel. The promise of the Messiah was always for the entire world. <laughs> Can anybody say amen? Because I think most of us are Scandahoovians, right? You know, something like that? Except for your German shepherd up here. But thank God it's for the whole world, amen? Amen. Jesus is the one who sets us free, but they're in this extreme sense of denial, and it's just amazing to me to see the sunsets and the sunrise. I, I see a lot of people posting pictures on Facebook. It's been just beautiful lately, hasn't it? That's by accident? I'm sorry. I don't have enough faith for that. The fact that we exist in the perfect orbit around the sun that, that sustains us all throughout the seasons, and it never moves by accident? The fact in the human body as we are created in the image of God, one strand of DNA has over 650,000 pages of information. By accident? I don't think so. I don't think so. God is the creator God of the universe. He's created humanity in his own image. And God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to buy us back from the hostage, hostage situation that we are in as we're born into sin. Now, I know that Adrian is a beautiful baby, and he is. And I'm going to have a grandson born within maybe the next two weeks here. I'm really excited, and he's going to be beautiful too. But he is born dead in his trespasses and sins. He is born in need of salvation in Christ Jesus. That's why the waters of baptism are so powerful as the Holy Spirit works through that water, bringing spiritual life when we are born dead in our trespasses and sins spiritually dead. We are actually born children of the devil, and that's really hard to hear. I understand that. But because of our sinful nature, that's just the reality. That's why Jesus came. Even in this chapter, because they didn't believe in Christ, because they rejected Christ as the Messiah, because they rejected the message of salvation that he was proclaiming, Jesus in love, speaking the truth in love, says, you are actually children of the devil. Now, isn't it amazing that you can not know that? Isn't it amazing that you can be in this sense of denial through pride and arrogance that you're not even willing to see the truth? I pray that that would never describe anyone here today, and I pray that I would never become like that. But Jesus lovingly reveals to those presents that this is a heart issue, has nothing to do with heritage, this has everything to do with where your heart is at before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in our text, truly I say to you, everyone, can I tell you what that word everyone means in the Greek? <laughs> everyone who commits sin. Has anyone sinned this week? Yeah. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And that's what he's trying to say. You are born this way. You're born held hostage by Satan, you are born in need of salvation in Christ Jesus. We need outside intervention. We need what Christ has come through his life, death, and resurrection to provide for you and for me. It's so interesting that as they were in that state of denial, but Jesus lovingly responds. They even started calling him names, which I, I find interesting. So if you could think of Samaritan as a really harsh harsh slang term that's very derogatory. 
So they look at him finally as they're starting to get angry because he keeps speaking the truth in love. They look at him and say, are we not right in saying that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus is calmly answers like, no, I do not have a demon. <laughs> and he continues to speak in truth in love to people who are unwilling to hear. This is the grace and mercy of God. The savior that leaves the 99 and goes after the one. The savior that even pursued me in the depths of my sin and the depths of my despair at the age of 24. He refused to stop pursuing me. And I am so grateful for that. And as he did not stop pursuing me, he revealed himself to me in a powerful way. And I really think that's what God wants to do in all of our hearts. God wants to reveal himself through Christ Jesus as Lord, Savior, Messiah. Continuing to trust in the, the, the salvation that, that comes through the waters of baptism and that we would do so all the days of our life, trusting in the completed work of Jesus Christ so that one day, as we do pass from this life to the next, maybe we'll hear those wonderful words of Christ. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest that I have prepared for you before the foundation of the world was even laid. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the Messiah who has come to set us free. And the one thing I pray that you leave here with is this last and final statement that Christ says in our text, that when the Son sets you free, you are truly free indeed. May we hold on to that promise all the days of our life. Lord, I thank you for this text and this great reminder that you are our Lord and Savior. And on this Reformation Sunday, we do thank you that truth won the day. And I pray that you would just continue to unite your church under the true gospel, under what it really says in scripture, and that we would always look to you as the author and the perfecter of our faith, who willingly went to the cross of Calvary to save each one of us through your gracious love and mercy. May we never take that for granted. And Lord, I do pray that you would bring to completion that which you started in every heart here this morning. I pray all of these things in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said...